Well, first off, thanks for coming on here, Saja. Thank you, brother. It's a pleasure to speak to you. Of course. So I want to get right into this thing. How would you describe what exactly it is that you do? Um, I talk about unconditional happiness. And what I do is in the community, I just post um, talks and meditations just on unconditional happiness. And how I define that is basically happiness that is uh, unconditional. There's no reason for it. You know, there's no there's no limitation on it. There's no requirement that we need to have. And in in most traditions, we call it awakening or uh, enlightenment. But I just I just throughout the years of just you know being a seeker, um, it's not that I it's not that I I want to dissociate from any type of spiritual kind of place. It's just more that I just like to use a more accurate word. You mm. know what I mean? Like uh, it just feels more more accurate to me to to kind of call it that so i'm I'm very interested in the in the pedagog pedagogical kind of things as well so a lot of the things i talk about is like how we articulate the message and what the you know what what like i just kind of see it in a very different way so that's kind of what i do i talk a lot about that especially with my one-to-one -one clients as well they're also very interested in like um the actual teaching and how we can kind of grow it and you know, just kind of make it more accessible. And that that's kind of what I'm interested in, uh, as well as just kind of talking about things like uh, non-duality um, mm -hmm. and awakening. So, yeah. Awesome. Unconditional happiness. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. Yeah, everyone wants that uh, subconsciously. Hmm. So where do we start? How does this all begin to find this unconditional happiness? It's a, uh, you know, the craziest thing is like, we're always looking for it. Like we're always looking for unconditional happiness. And what I've noticed, and you might've seen this too, is it's like a deep unconscious desire to be unconditionally happy or just just happiness in general most people uh most people they they believe that there's a condition on happiness yeah so they will find they will look for the condition mm -hmm. so um and this is like this is how i've been defining the the kundalini awakening is like basically just realizing absolutely that there is no condition on happiness that you cannot find it in the world it's not it's not a full awakening it's not like a um like an absolute knowing of the tr of, of of our true nature but it's like almost as good because it's like the energy is just so focused and that's where they kind of have that analogy of the the serpent the serpents at the bottom and the energy rises and at the bottom is like you know symbolically uh survival power control money and it's symbolic of just our search in the world of ten thousand things and then it's symbolic of the energy rising it goes into the heart and then we have like back to yoga then we have like jnana and then we have unconditional happiness which is uh we you know when the, when the energy is so focused that there's absolutely zero conviction that happiness can be found in the world or any in any type of object or um experience mm -hmm. yeah it's ironic because we described it as something that everybody wants deep down. But I think what you're alluding to is you have to let go of the want in order to be able to realize the unconditionality of it, right? I would say that it's almost like we have the desire for truth here, and then we have the desire to remove suffering here. Mm. And when we're young, we all have this desire for truth. It's like, we don't know what truth, but we just have this natural curiosity. And then when we start suffering, which is when we start, how I define it, it's just basically when we start resisting our experience because we don't have a way of processing 
uh, drastic changes in our environment. Like I use the example of my mum and my dad when, when they were fighting when I was really young. I'm watching TV and all of a sudden I'm watching a cartoon and then two minutes later my parents are having a really aggressive argument. Mm. When you're five years old, we don't have, we don't know how to adapt to that change, right? Um, and that's what I call stress. And then, and then later on, we go, well, I avoided the experience last time. So then later on, we go, well, maybe I'll avoid it again yeah. when the next trigger comes up. But the body doesn't know a difference between the parents having an argument, a tiger coming to kill me, or or anything else, or just a simple experience, just a non-violent experience that has triggered a residual tendency that I then so that my body doesn't know the difference if that's actually happening again or not. So I go, what happened before? Well, last time I survived when I didn't, when I ignored what was going on, I just didn't, 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 you know, try to avoid it and not yeah. experience it. If I just do that again, I'll survive. I'll be safe. You see? And then, then we have mm -hmm. that mechanism of resistance. But anyway, so um, that uh, process of resistance, it's what is obviously what creates the suffering in our experience. And I sidetracked a little bit. Where were we going with that again? I think what you're getting at, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you, we have the, you said you have truth ah, and so then yes. we have, okay, go ahead. You can yes, yes you got it. Thank you. <laughs> so there's the desire for, for truth and the desire to remove suffering. And when we're young, we have the desire for truth. Then we start to suffer. We have the desire to remove suffering. And they're not, they're not two different things. They're more like a, like a circle, right? They're mm. more like a, like a, like a, like a spectrum. And what we find is that the desire for truth and the desire to remove suffering, they're two sides of the same coin. However, when we desire truth, we're not worrying about our suffering. And when we're not worrying about our suffering, we're in openness. And that openness is like the prerequisite for unconditional happiness. It's not going to make us unconditionally happy, but it will allow us to recognize unconditional happiness because now we're not trying to we're not trying to find unconditional happiness in order to remove our suffering. Yeah. Because if we're trying to find unconditional happiness to remove our suffering, we are by definition resisting our experience. And you cannot have unconditional happiness if you're, the prerequisite is resistance, you see? Mm -hmm. So it's like, um, it's like, yeah, it's the ultimate prerequisite. Is that just like innate desire for truth? Yeah. Wow. It's good stuff, man. We're getting right into this. Yeah. <laughs> So where does this all come from for you? How did you have this pretty profound realization? And um, yeah, how did you integrate it? Can you give us a little bit of your story if you want to? You don't have to if you don't want to get too into it. But uh, yeah, I like to get into people's journey of being able to see this and realize this so people can yeah. relate. Um, so... For me to put it to put it as shortly as possible, um, it was it was suffering. There was a deep for me. My experience was deep curiosity for science and truth when I was young. Then it was suffering when my mum died. I was brought up Christian, so I had a Christian background. Um, stopped believing in God when she died, but had this kind of like lingering but maybe he does exist if i if he doesn't exist then my mum's really dead and i don't want to really accept that like mm. she's just having this like blank screen type of death you know what i mean like there's nothing in it raised obviously these questions as to death and experience like that and then uh i was really depressed like gradually up until i was 17 and um i said uh, i i was i was in my car one day and i just said to myself like this can't be life it just can't be this way it's absolutely ridiculous if it is yeah. this is <laughs> so so i just said to myself that either i would uh kill myself or find a way to to be happy like find there must be some ancient old man on earth somewhere that just knows all the answers and mm -hmm. i wanted to find that ancient old man like i just wanted to know like there must be someone on earth who has a clue you know um, and, th and that was kind of what, 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 what I desired. And I said, well, where do I start? And then I remembered uh, Steve Jobs was someone who I kind of looked up to when I was young and I loved like design and technology, you know, like DNP in school, do you call it that? Like design and technology. 
like technology no. class or like yeah yeah we had stuff like that but it wasn't called dnt yeah i know you're talking about okay. so we you. had like, anyone from the uk watching you'll know what dnt is so we had dnt class and like he, i i kind of like you know would research him for his you know design innovation and um i, I remember I, I remember hearing a quote from him at the time was meaningless to me but he said the two things that changed his life was reading the book be here now and taking lsd and the minute mm. I thought that thought, and I thought, well, where, like, where do I begin? Like, I had no spiritual background. Was, I, I didn't want to Google. I didn't know what to YouTube someone. So it was Steve Jobs that said that. And then I thought, well, Steve Jobs seems to have a pretty fun life. I thought I would, uh, you know, see what he was talking about. So that was when I um, took LSD and read the book Be Here Now. And then here we are today. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's Obviously, a, a lot foundation. happened in between, but that was really the that was really the the kind of you know the defining moment uh, of this path. Yeah, yeah, man. Looking for the people or person that knows, as you said, Ramdas is a perfect example. I find mm. in his writings and his lectures, I'm like, he knows something. He definitely knows. There's a sense of confidence in the way that he's able to speak from, and that. Yeah is priceless yeah so i revere ramdas greatly and uh for good reason you know steve jobs you and many other people have got that sort of transmission it seems from ramdas who got it from ultimately neem karoli baba right mm -hmm. yeah. do you think there's like this subtle transmission of people that do have this knowing that are able to almost bestow it upon others you know like spread it almost like a virus a good virus into the hearts of others um i think that if I, I i in 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 my experience if you if you can transmit uh enthusiasm mm. in, enthusiasm you, you 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 in order to transmit understanding you have to you have to first understand yeah, obviously. exactly. And then the second thing would be to imbue enthusiasm into into what you do. Mm. And one could argue, well, Raman Maharshi wasn't very enthusiastic. Most of the stuff he said was about three words long, and you know. But you've got to remember that Raman Maharshi's character, the way that he expressed enthusiasm, which is, you know, we we get this from some Greek word somewhere that says something like uh, to to fuse with God. Um, which makes sense. The word enthusiasm, it's, it's, it's very enthused with God whenever we're... That's the translation for enthusiasm? That's the origin of the word, yeah, to fuse with That's God. That's perfect. I never knew that. Okay. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's crazy. Yeah. Some of the words are just ridiculous. I'm, I'm like, did they, did they, is this a coincidence? Was this just like universal alignment or did they actually sit there and like map out that word and be like, this is exactly what it's referring to. Mm. But anyway, so... Um, he, you know, some could argue, well, Ram Nahaji wasn't like enthusiastic, like he wasn't very vocal, right? <laughs> but his life was his enthusiasm. The man walked around with a stick naked in his underwear in a temple with like a group of followers. And like, he allowed that to be the thing. And like, yeah. and when I say he allowed that, like he allowed people to see him as almost a deity. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you've got to you've got to remember that that's something that he he allowed to happen, right? I'm not going to sit there and allow anyone to touch my feet like like Neem Crawley Baba, you see. Um, but Neem Crawley he made he made the choice to do that, you see, and the same with Ramana Maharshi, he made the choice to do that, and that's his that's his enthusiasm. And one could say that, oh, you shouldn't have gurus like that and things like that. And, and I agree that nowadays, I don't think it's necessary to have people touching people's feet and to idolize these teachers. But we've also got to remember that how quickly time has changed in the past 100 years. When Rama Naharshi was, was famous, which wasn't obviously 100 years ago, but it was in India at a time where there was no internet. There was nothing to... to uh, you know, Ram Nahashi is not going to sit there and make a YouTube video like me, you see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and the reason for that. So so what was he using? He was using the 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 idea of the deity, the idea of the guru. 
because yeah. the guru spread. The, 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 that was what was working, you know? Devotion. Mm -hmm. Devotion. And think about like when someone's, someone is perceived with such authority, that's greater than the internet. You know, so that's really mm. going to spread the message. And, and lo and behold, how many people do we know around the world today that know of Ramana Maharshi? The man never made a YouTube video. He didn't do a single thing. He never wrote his own book. He never did anything. Yeah. You know, so that's yeah. where that 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 guru identity has has a place. Yeah. 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 For that special place and time of the 20th century. It needed to be yeah. in that formula. But now yeah. it seems as though the formula is different. We still revere the previous formula. Yeah. But it's not like that anymore, really. It's yeah. sort of evolved. It's the same understanding, though, but it's yeah. an evolution of how the understanding is transmitted. So, exactly. Yeah. And who knows where so that's that going to go in the future? That's a question with enthusiasm. So, that's what I would say. I would say you can. You just have to be enthusiastic about it. This is why, like some people, mm. and and you don't have to use words for that enthusiasm. That enthusiasm doesn't need words. Is is the point I was trying to make? So yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and you don't have to create a YouTube channel. You don't have to create a podcast. Exactly. You can transmit this understanding in your everyday life. You know, you can have Buddha on the sidewalk. I actually met this lady yesterday. She was my cashier, yeah. and there was just something about her. I brought her the stuff, um, without going too much into the story, I brought her the stuff for a, a mouth sore, <laughs> and mm -hmm. she was like, oh, are you in pain? And she was just asking about me and just like really involved, and she was just a cashier at CVS. I could just that's see good. something in her eyes, and I'm like, that's the Buddha. The love that she transmitted. Yeah. And I'm like, there's something like I left there feeling just, I just felt it. Like I felt just the love Painful. that came from her. So yeah, yeah, point of the story is it's like, you don't have to do anything grandiose. You just, you just be you in whatever situation, circumstance that you're in, you be you almost as like a, uh, um, a vessel of love for others in whatever your situation is. And it'll just, it'll percolate and spread how it needs to spread. Like that lady has no clue that she's now on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And she had no clue that she made you feel this way. Yeah, that too. Exactly. So it's magic in that way. It's very magical. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah man, I feel it. It's this, uh, it's this transmission of love. You know, it's this uh, channeling of love that comes about from this understanding. And that is truly priceless. I feel as though the unconditional happiness and unconditional love go hand in hand it's almost the same exact thing maybe the unconditional happiness is what transmits the unconditional love and they go back and forth in some kind of dance but yeah, yeah. um that's the essence of it man it's it's beautiful it's beautiful yeah. magic that one finds yeah. himself in i would um, also argue that go ahead. the you could also say that like it's almost like the truth is always revealing itself um it's just it's like if we, we, we like we see it, we experience beauty, love all the time. But the, typically, the beauty and the love that we see, it, it's not coming with a load of words, right? It's not coming with some type of uh, and uh, some type of uh, some type of transcription, you know. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. No, one, the beauty's not telling you how it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so in a way, the, the, you know, even just sharing what I do, we're kind of like a clown, you know, we're kind <laughs> of like clowns just doing this because. We're telling people how it's beautiful. We're telling people where the beauty comes from. It's it's almost a. This is why they say that the the, the you know the, the the most the most profound teaching is silence, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but but we still need words, you know. Mm. We still <laughs> we're just unnecessary. So it's almost like we've got a the transmission. It doesn't come from the the body or the mind, but it's just like the body and the mind aren't aren't hiding it anymore. You know, the the, the body and the mind are more clear vessels to just express what's already being shared continuously all the time it's almost like it just makes it slightly slightly easier to to recognize in our own experience you know so i just wanted to i just wanted to add that mm. that's well said so what is it in you that wants to express this because if we can fully recognize that it's all about the silence the stillness yeah uh Yet we're on here on the podcast, sort of being clowns, like you said, some sort of ironic joke. What do you, yeah. would you say 
drives you to want to express this and yeah why It's just the funnest thing I can think of doing, mm. in all honesty. Like, it's just, uh, like, I've done so many other things. Like, <laughs> like, I just, I'm very, I'm a very creative person. So typically what I like to do is just, like, build things, um, contemplate things. And it just so happens that this version of contemplating things is the one I enjoy the most. It's just the one that I do, the one I find the most interest in. And a lot of times I'd find myself thinking that, yeah, okay, that's cool, but what do I want to do for money? What do I want to do for a job? You know, I, I could do anything um, I wanted to do. And I would build, you know, I, I worked in, you know, like a starving entrepreneur, just building new business ideas and just struggling and not knowing what to do with it. Um, I just wasn't enjoying them. I wasn't just like they were just things I was doing. I just didn't enjoy them. Yeah. Um, and I kept coming back to this. I'd always host, you know, like meditations and things, just because I just found it fun. I never charged for it. I still don't charge for it now, really. Um, but now I just have more of a business mindset to to actually live off doing this with you know one to one work and things like that. So, so now I'm able to 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 have fun, give it away for free, and it, where it comes from is just. I just realized that it's just why would I not do the most fun thing I enjoy? It would be yeah. it would be it would be it would be a a form of ignorance to to ignore that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like oh, <laughs> it kind of makes me laugh to think of why would we do the non fun thing? And that isn't always the funnest thing for some people to do. And maybe one day painting will be the funnest thing to do. And all I will do is just like prioritize my life to, to 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 be able to paint every day um right now i love making music as well that's also something i love to do and right now a part of my life is like also building like how can i create this orbit where i get to do and have the most funnest day every day all the time that's kind of what i'm doing and this is a part of it you see it's not the whole thing it's a uh, sharing this is a part of my orbit it's not it's not the entire orbit Mm. But it's a big part of it. It's a fun part, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just having a good time. Myself. Yeah, man. So yeah, yeah, that's where I'd say it comes from. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. And also, from my point of view, I feel as though there's nothing better to talk about, even though, like we said, words really never do this wavelength justice. I still feel as though coming on here with people like you, there's no higher pursuit if you even want to call it a pursuit it's like i know i could talk about sports i could talk about video games i could talk about game of thrones whatever it is i could turn the camera on and talk about that stuff if i really want to like everybody else but i feel as though the pinnacle of using this equipment in time um is coming on here and talking about you know who am i what's going on here and trying to siphon some wisdom from people like you so yeah i enjoy it as well but also it's like the subject matter uh, i enjoy right there's no higher um there's no higher fun than talking about um what we are and trying to figure it out with somebody you know channeling yeah. some kind of truth and uh yeah maybe somebody else enjoys it as well the listener enjoys it as well point of my story is like what else am i going to talk about at this point yeah <laughs> you know yeah yeah, yeah. somebody's got to do it yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly, man. You're absolutely right. It's, just, it's fulfilling a fulfilling an important role. Yeah, um, I think so. And yeah. this stuff doesn't. I mean, I'm not trying to sound arrogant. I really. All right, I'm just gonna say it. It's like this stuff doesn't expire either. Like the stuff we're talking about now, Dharma, wisdom. Mm -hmm. Everyone else's content on the internet. It's like they make it one day, and the next day it's kind of old. This stuff is timeless. The stuff that me and you talk about, it yeah. sort of can help people for as long as we're in the human condition. It can hopefully help guide people um, for as long as they're suffering, essentially. And that's my goal is to create like a sort of timelessness. And I think mm -hmm. that's what happens too is like you realize timelessness. And then I think from our words is a transmission of timelessness, if that makes sense. Like there's there's some kind of 
element to the wisdom that we transmit that becomes not a part of the zeitgeist, you could say. It's more a part of the timeless nature of our being. Like the words morph. We morph into the words in a certain way. It's almost like when they said the word became flesh. And yeah. now we're, we're coming back. The flesh is coming back into the word. You know, it's that essence. I hope that made sense. It was a little esoteric, yeah. but um, yeah. yeah, it's like when you speak about the right thing, the wisdom, the wisdom will, will stand eternally, you know? Yeah. And I don't even do it for that reason. I just recognize that. <laughs> I just yeah, recognize yeah. that. I'm not doing it so I can, you know, hopefully live forever throughout the word and blah, blah, blah. It's just like, I just recognize that in that higher pursuit is a higher pursuit of um, timelessness. And uh, it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. cool to say yeah, the Yeah, I fully agree, man. Yeah. I also see it as like this, these these conversations and, and just sharing about uh, what we could say is spirituality. Um, they it, it, it allows for all the other conversations to be had as well. That's true, And all the yeah. other conversations allow for this to be had. And it's like almost this, like, sometimes I tell people, like, you need to get better at talking about the weather. You know, mm. because it's so important. It's mm. so important. You know, and I've had so many conversations with um, people about the weather, which I thoroughly enjoy. You know, and sometimes I'm like, um, sometimes I feel like they're 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 the same almost. Like, like, yeah, I like sometimes I, I just jump on calls and and uh, and I just appreciate just experiencing the fact that sun is shining through the window. Um, and I think things like that are also, it's almost like the fact that these conversations exist allow us to enjoy those conversations even more. Do you see what yeah. I mean? Ironically, yes. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then it, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting, um, <laughs> it's an interesting harmony, right? It's a, it's a harmony. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a perfect harmony of, of, of contrast, right? Cause on the one level we say like, it's so superficial, conversation it's a it's a thing that we say to kind of you know when we're um having small talk right mm -hmm. but um the small talk is the big talk and the big talk mm. small talk yeah <laughs> yep i get that <sighs> it's almost like um yeah i mean i just spoke about the subject matter and there's no higher pursuit of knowledge and blah 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 but at the end of the day the subject matter doesn't matter it's like it's just about being with somebody. It's just about being open with somebody. It doesn't even matter what you're talking about at the end of the day. In some respect, in some regard, it does, depending on both parties' intentions. But like yeah. you said, you could have a very loving, very wise conversation just about baseball <laughs> if you're really yeah. in tune with each other. Yeah, yeah, I get that. It's just about tuning in with the other person and being open and having no conditions i think to the expression and the experience of talking with somebody that is very powerful that is a sadhana in itself i think conversation yeah. is like a spiritual practice but i'm coming yeah. to find doing this over 200 episodes it's that yeah. and socrates found this out as well is like having a dialogue with somebody like truly just opening up with somebody is very powerful and you know that you know you have one-on-ones with people many other people that i spoke to have one-on-ones there's something that is just, it's almost like a meditation in a way to be able to go back and forth. And it doesn't even matter what I'm saying. The, the fact that we're just sitting here listening to each other is, um, it's powerful. I don't know how else to explain it. It's cool. And it's, uh, it's cool. <laughs> yeah. It's a powerful yeah. spiritual practice yeah. that I think can attune one to, uh, the truth, the beauty yeah. that we're talking about, the love. And, uh, yeah, I encourage everybody to try that. Anyone that's listening here is just, have a conversation with somebody, but truly just sit down and, and listen. I think it, this essence comes from listening. What's that saying? And there's a, a certain cliche about most people's conversation is just them talking to themselves, right? To other people. Yeah. It's just like they just talk about themselves. Well, yeah. Make it a little bit less about yourself and let the other person speak a little bit. And then you'll find this beautiful dance and harmony that exists yeah. in the moment together. Sorry, did you have something to say? No, no, I, f I fully agree with you, man. Um, and yeah, just to come back, like, I, I, I also want to add as well, like, 
you know, when I'm saying that right now, I'm just appreciating that there's light coming through the window. Um, some days the sun's burning my face, and I'm like, for fuck's sake, the light's shining through the window. <laughs> Mm-hmm. you know <laughs> mm-hmm. so like and, and 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 i just want to bring like equal because this is the paradox it's like it's not like i i also enjoy that experience you know and i think the pa- people get stuck in thinking that um there's like these power like this this absolute it's either one or the other you know and i and i think one of the one of my favorite quotes i heard from uh francis in an interview francis lucille is that oh not an interview but in like some type of uh in one of his calls Someone was like, Francis, I've, I was sitting in a park bench the other day and um, like I was trying to meditate and there was these like young group of kids and they were like swearing and smoking and drinking. And it was just like, it was, it, it was starting to really annoy me and I didn't want to be there. Um, and I tried to like, you know, you know, the Buddhist approach where, you know, the, the metaphor of the, you know, the, the Buddhists in the, um, the part in a retreat and the bell is going off and someone says to the um uh the 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 mentor whoever um like uh, i don't know what you call them sir monk whatever you are um yeah. the bell keeps going off every morning it's really putting me off my meditation and then the the, the teacher's like um the bell's not annoying you you're annoying the bell or something like that basically just persist through the bell the the annoyance um, and then, and then, in contrast to that, there's the Francis uh, when she, the woman asks, "I was on the bench and it was really annoying me. And I didn't want to be around these kids. Um, what would have been?" And, and I and eventually, I had to just leave. And then he, she said, "What would have been the enlightened thing to do?" And he said, "To have left 15 minutes sooner." <laughs> yeah, you know, and <laughs> it's just so true. We don't have to. We don't have to put up with things that we don't want, and that's the essence of it. If we don't want something, we don't have to put up with it. The problem is, is that people try to resist things that they cannot control. You see, this is the, this is the this is the biggest problem and the biggest crux is that people think that spirituality is about the woman sitting on the bench. And just like meditating and having the peaceful experience with the people swearing and, you know, not enjoying or like, you know, kind of like just not being the vibe that she's really looking for. And they think that it's just persist, persisting through that when when it's not. <laughs> you just yeah. do what you want. That's the, the reality of it. And if there's no other possibility that these kids aren't going to go and she's trapped to the bench and she's chained then it's necessary to just be at peace and just not have to worry about it. It's something you can't control. So yeah, um, just wanted to 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 mention that as well. Yeah. Felt like coming out. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel as though there is a discernment that comes from this wavelength, like a um, better decision making that comes from this wavelength? Uh, mm. Yeah, just a intuitive guidance that you feel when you know you just know what to do from the sense of stillness? I, I, I want to say something to that, but I'm curious as to know what, what what's your experience been with that process? Of what, what I just described? Found, like, yeah, yeah. What have you found? Because hmm? so many people say that there's no, there's no chooser there's no chooser of thoughts, obviously. We're not choosing thoughts. But there is creativity. Mm. And when we say that there's no individual, there is no individual chooser that does anything. But that doesn't mean that nothing is being... When you talk about choice from the absolute, it's redundant because you cannot make a choice from an absolute place. You see, it's impossible. Absolute means there is no option. Is just absolute, you see. Yeah. But the thing is, is that that expresses into relativity. Exactly. So what we you you can't we can't claim that there is a decider, but it doesn't mean there's not a choice like a choice like ability. Yeah. You exactly. know. And that choice like ability, um, I'm saying this just to kind of prerequisite what I was what I'm going to say, but that choice like ability is an is a necessary maturity on the path 
that a lot of people gaslight in the spirit in the spiritual tradition tradition uh, in the spiritual communities um a lot of teachers they, they just say there's no chooser you just kind of just go with your up-to-date conditioning and do these things and just let life continue and it, it's just a very passive perspective um that i think avoids a lot of autonomy yeah and I, from my experience absolutely i think that what we're really looking to do here and even if i'm wrong i don't care because this is just the way i like to live is that we're here to create a really autonomous experience mm. a really like like think about it the, the, let's just think of the opposite the opposite of freedom is feeling like we're forced to do what we have to do right yeah feeling like there's no control over what we do and don't do it's like like literally like imagine if someone was like standing behind me and moving my arms and saying everything that would be a complete lack of freedom and that is what most people are suggesting is basically that the, the, what most people are teaching is that 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 is basically what's happening and instead of us instead of somebody else it's just god doing that and there's this mm. individual experiencer that has no control but the problem is is obviously we're not the individual experiencer we are the god that is behind us doing all the things so when you look at it through that perspective there's absolutely choice and decision and we're actually here to be the ultimate expression of that freedom so i think that these decisions it it makes us have better decisions because we're not we're no longer dependent on those decisions to make us happy exactly in other words there's no possibility of making a mistake and the mm. only problem people ever have when making decisions is that they don't want to be wrong they don't want mm. to make the wrong decision and a wrong decision is always a decision that results in less happiness that's what we mean by a wrong choice i made the wrong choice now i have to walk to work i made the wrong choice now i've missed the bus i made the and what that means is now i have to do something i don't want to do or now i have to do something that sacrifices my happiness so yeah i mean it, it, the, the, we, we, we might make mistakes on on relative level like maybe saying that wasn't the best thing i could have said but the point is is that we're not judging ourselves for for causing some conflict and we know how to handle the conflict you know so i would agree yeah it's completely um it's completely uh helps with decision making but more so helps us realize that there are decisions to make <laughs> yeah for a lot of spiritual people they don't even they they, they try to avoid making decisions because decisions is all just happening in in god and there's no you know there's no choice so it's yeah. uh do you see what i'm trying to say yeah 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 i think that was actually very well said i don't have much else to add i know you asked me but i think you uh you answered your own question right there you described like two different sides of the poles of the uh, of the spectrum the absolute sense and the relative sense and i think this realization is coming to know that um, it's weighing the paradox. It's being able to weigh the absolute with the relative. And that's what our true being is in a way. It's greater than that. It's, you know, it's obviously beyond words, but it's being able to weigh the different aspects of our being. So they are in refinement. And it's not, it's not just all God and you're this puppet and you're not just the puppet either. It's both. It's, there's this sort of dance, I think, as I spoke of before that, um, that is able to just know what is best in the moment to align in this happiness. It's like the decisions aren't being made by the puppet per se. I mean, there, it is and it isn't. It's both. Like I said, it's both and neither. It's, it's hard to say. <clears throat> it's hard to say definitely here. The same thing. Yeah, it's the yeah. same thing. Exactly. So the essence of this whole idea we're on right now is being able to not get stuck on just one absolute explanation of what we are it's like free will or predetermination well it's both it's both it's a fluidity between both of those sides of the spectrum and uh, it's hard to just say it in one sentence or a few sentences because when you end the sentence at the period you're going to come to some kind of absolute when it's really no absolute there's no absolute that can explain it other than it's yeah. both and neither <laughs> Yeah. but i do feel guidance i guess i do feel some sort of guidance the puppet of gary feels some sort of guidance to the best decision that can be made in whatever moment 
um, it is. And it's from, yeah. you could say God, maybe the higher self, maybe, but it's like a higher intelligence that comes into me to make the right decision on whatever comes about in my life. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, I, 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 I totally agree with you, man. And that's the thing is we, we look for absolutes. The, the separate self wants an absolute. It wants to be either a man or it wants to be a woman. It yeah. wants to be the no self or it wants to be the self. It wants to be the absolute or it wants to be the relative. It wants to be duality. It wants to be non-duality. It wants to be infinite consciousness or it wants to be a separate self. It just wants to be this one thing. Yeah. And that's the problem. <laughs> it's everything and nothing, which means that it's it, you can't put words to that, which also means that it is the experience of the cup of coffee and it's the experience of God and it's the experience of smoke or, or, or what do you want to call that? Um, uh, what do you call it again? When it when a coffee steam steam, steam, steam. That's the one. <laughs> it's also the experience of steam. It's the experience of temperature, but it's also the experience of sensation. And then sensation is the experience of perception, and perception is the experience of consciousness. And consciousness is not an experience, but yet we still experience it because it's not an objective experience. So you 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 can see it from all these layers. Ultimately, it, it's like <laughs> there is no absolute. And yeah. that's the paradox. And when we see that clearly, that's the harmonox. It's a harmonious Ooh, paradox. Good. It means just come up with that. Not... The harmo the harmonox, yeah. Harmonox. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah. That's good. It, I use it to just to say the the the, the to because the, the paradox is we all, we all know the paradox. Why am I still suffering if I'm infinite consciousness? That's a paradox. That's someone who says, I am infinite consciousness and I don't want to be anything else. Mm -hmm. You see? The harmonox is. I am absolutely all things and fully comprehending that there's no paradox left, but that's the paradox because <laughs> yeah. the ultimate paradox is the fact that there shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to, you can't solve a paradox, but you, you have, and that is a paradox itself, which makes it the harmonox. <laughs> that's good, man. Yeah. <laughs> and then you just got to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think we just figured it out, <laughs> but there's nothing to figure out. <sighs> yeah, I just got to take a deep breath. Hey, man, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. The Harmonox, that's good, though. If you ever write a book, that should be the title. The Harmonox. I love that, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, man. I think we just figured out the universe on that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though. Uh, yeah, I mean, it might sound like craziness to somebody listening, like, what the heck are these guys talking about? But I feel it. I feel it from you that you have this understanding, and I feel it here and now within myself. So that's it. This whole idea that isn't an idea is just a subjective experience at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we made sense. Hopefully we made sense. I, I'm pretty sure we made sense. But at the end of the day, the sense truly only comes from within oneself. Like we're just, we're just like we said before, clowns. We're just like guides here. We're almost like providing a sort of testament. I like to say we're like almost like proof, recording proof in some kind of way for others yeah. to hopefully um, to shine others back to themselves. You know, like I just like to say like what we do is just to be able to have others realize this. It doesn't come from a YouTube video. It doesn't come from Ramana Maharshi, any kind of book. Those are all just guides and fingers pointing at the moon. But essentially this, this knowing, this experiencing comes from within one's own experience, the separate self. That's another paradox is the separate self is what has to recognize the absolute self. And then you go back and forth, you know, um, at the end of the day, what I'm just trying to say is like, I'm not going to do it for you. And neither is Saja. We can help we can help guide and that's all we can do. And, uh, yeah, I don't have anything else to say, man. I think we might've exhausted everything we could say, but do you have <laughs> anything that you want to, um, end the pod on anything you want to get off your chest? Um, I just wanted to mention just kind of back to, to what you asked me earlier. 
um, which was about integrating this, like integrating mm -hmm. this kind of understanding. And I want to share it because I think it's a, an important thing that I kind of forgot to add to what I was saying earlier. Oh, that's good. We'll, we'll ground ourselves here. We do. We'll come back, come back to <laughs> earth. Yeah. <laughs> which is, um, my process was through, uh, psychedelics and just raw dogging contemplation and the 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 psychedelic experience is the same as in my experience it's the same as any normal awakening um i've had normal awakening experiences when you could consider no there's no psychoactive substance involved there's just a normal just nothing particular is happening and I've had psychedelic experiences. And one thing I wanted to add, if anyone's listening who's ever interested in this or has been going through this, is that these uh, the, the, it's always a story about how we recognize what we are. It's always like, oh, I took this, or I did this, or that happened. But ultimately, yeah. this the 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 experiences are not the things that that wake us up. They like these little. Um, they like these little, like, prods from the universe. Mm. Like it doesn't mm. matter how. I, I know a lot of like Leo. Uh, you know, like Leo, the guy does actualized, talks a lot about these like profound DMT like blasting off universes and and talks about these very cr crazy experiences of like deep like just these depths of the truth, but. In all of those experiences, there is this one simple experience that we keep coming back to. And it's this the one that we're having right now is stateless. Here and now. There's no thing to it, right? It's like no matter what anybody tells us about their awakening experience, it was an experience. And it's never going to be the experience because the only experience is the one that we're having. And I think that it all points back. And this is when I realized this the contemplations i was doing took a different turn and that was coinc coinciding with when i met rupert spira who uh, is pretty much i didn't realize at the time it was basically my teacher is like kind of the person who gives birth to you you don't really get a second mother you know <laughs> whoever gives birth to you is like your mum. um in in a, in a weird way there's that spiritual sense uh, with him because you can't really uh, no one else is going to be able to kind of transmit that language to me and that language was just exploring this direct experience um as it is and i think that the real integration comes when we uh we we stop avoiding our normal humanity yeah like this normal humanity right this like just the farts and the burps and the giggles, you know, just like all this just raw dog humanity, which is just like, and, and like even just like the impatience in a queue or um, the, 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 the frustration at a video game, yeah. you know, um, and these are legitimate things. People think they're, they're unenlightened things like patience. It, I just use patience as an example. We think that, like, like we're coming back to the absolutes, and this is again the comprehension of the absolute, the comp comp uh, the comprehension of the the harmonox, is that there are times for everything. There is time to be angry. There is time to to be, I wouldn't say aggressive, but like physically. But there's times to show aggression. There's times to show love, and there's times to show frustration. You see, and just to use impatience as an example, like if we think of the classic impatience as being in a queue, um, it's if we're in a queue and this, this, you know, we're waiting in Tesco's, but we've got to be at our daughter's piano recital at three, and but we also need to pick up our grandmother's med medication um, from from the store before it closes. Um, it's it's necessary to be more impatient i would suggest it's not a resistance to the now it's a practical impatience it's the yeah. the impatience that has got me on a flight 
right? Which took me through, just, I just ran through the queue and just was like, I'm lit. I, it was true. I was about to miss my flight, right? The, this type of impatience is like a necessary impatience. It's not the same pa- impatience that's like, oh, I'm in the queue. There's nothing happening later. And I just don't like, I don't like the now, right now. The last thing I want to do is experience this, this, this standing in a queue in a shop. That's, that's basically what impatience is, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> On that level, it's like the resistance to the now. Um, so it's really just uh, something I wanted to mention is like the, these absolute necessities with some experiences that we avoid through this almost uh, spiritual misunderstanding mm. of just being a human being. Yeah, well said. Very well said. Be here now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Well, I think that's a good note to wrap this up at. Um, I thank you for coming on here. I wish you all the best for the future. Keep doing your thing. And uh, yeah, that's it, man. Thank you. Peace and love. Pleasure, brother. Pleasure for to sure. speak to you. Man. And thank you to anyone that listened this long. Peace and love to you. And that's it, man. Um, yeah, I'm kind of speechless at this point. <laughs> Peace and love to you, Sajra, and peace and love to everybody that listened. Goodbye.